Okay, so today we had a case in which there is a 50 year old gentleman who presented with dyspnea on exertion for a couple of days and there was a feeling of uneasiness also. So on examination, he was hemodynamically stable. There was no chest signs, but the saturation was low, 89 to 90%. Uh, ECG was okay. There was slight sinus tachycardia in this particular patient. There was no swelling in the uh, lower limbs. So, but he is, is a, a smoker for that matter. There was a history of smoking present. So, on the basis of clinical suspicion, we thought of pulmonary embolism and he was uh, asked to get pulmonary angio, CT pulmonary angio done and we found a pulmonary embolism. So, it was a classical case of uh, pulmonary embolism. Now, the question is whether we need to thrombolize this patient or not thrombolize. Obviously, the patient is already started on anticoagulants. Now, my question to the students is whether we need to thrombolize this patient or not thrombolize. So let's understand a little bit about pulmonary embolism and then we'll see whether we need to thrombolize in this patient or not. So those of you who don't know, this is the mechanism by which pulmonary embolism develops. There occurs in the deep veins, there uh, occurs a thrombus formation and the thrombus get dislodged and through here it goes to the inferior vena cava, comes to the right atrium, then into the right ventricle and then goes to the pulmonary trunk, right and left divides into right to left and this creates a problem. So because there is no forward flow, there is no blood reaching to the lungs for oxygenation, the patient gets desaturated. Secondly, there is a problem with the forward flow of the blood. If it is large, it obstructs the flow and the patient will develop hypotension. So these are the things, this is the mechanism by which pulmonary embolism works. So this is the scan of the patient you can see here. The, uh, I'll show you. This is the pulmonary trunk. This is the right pulmonary, uh, sorry, pulmonary trunk and dividing to right and left pulmonary trunk. And you can see this is the dye and dye should go straight in both the trunks. But what is happening, you see the, here is a filling defect. This is the filling defect. This is the thrombus. Here also it is the filling defect. This is the thrombus. You see that this is the filling defect. This is the thrombus. So this is, this is the filling defect and this is the thrombus. So bilateral pulmonary embolism. It is not sidal embolism, which is a horseshoe shape because it is not connecting in between, but still extensive pulmonary embolism is there. Now, the question is whether we need to thrombolize this patient or not. So for that, let's see what the guidelines say. So this is, this is the table in which high, intermediate and low risk we have divided the patient and three parameters you need to focus on hemodynamic instability rv dysfunction and elevated cardiac cancer don't think don't skip you can for this simplicity you can skip this uh, pulmonary embolism cvt index we'll not discuss this you focus on three things hemodynamic instability rv dysfunction on echo or elevated pro bnp sort of thing now if the patient is hemodynamically stable so in all these it is negative but if the patient is hemodynamically stable means the pulmonary embolism is so severe that it is obstructing the forward flow uh, right uh, forward flow to the right heart and patient is becoming hypotensive it's a clear indication we should thrombolize this patient so hemodynamically instability is present we should thrombolize now this is the rv dysfunction and it is the cardiac troponins rv dysfunction means the structural things so on echo you find the pa pressures are high the rarv are dilated like that and elevated cardiac troponin or uh, pro bnp levels you see the pro bnp levels are also high it means that there is a functional problem with the myocardial injury of the right atrium, right ventricle. So if patient is hemodynamically stable, there is no evidence of RV dysfunction, the patient is having cardiac markers negative, means there is no uh, uh, strain on the heart, no myocardial injury, a patient is hemodynamically stable, we don't need to thrombolize this patient. We can just continue with anticoagulants. Now the question arises when the patient is hemodynamically stable, but there is evidence on echocardiography that the patient is having uh, RARV dilatation or PA pressures are raised and there are elevated cardiac troponin or cardiac pro BNP levels when there is a myocardial injury. So if both the PA pressures or RV dysfunction structural changes are present and the functionally myocardial injury is present, PA uh, troponin or pro BNP levels are elevated, if both of them are present, the patient may get benefited from thrombolysis on case-to-case -case basis you should decide it will benefit more in terms of a thrombolysis. But if either of them is present, means RARV dysfunction is present like on ECHO, you have RARV dilatation or PA pressure is elevated, but cardiac markers are normal or vice versa. Cardiac markers are elevated, but there is no evidence on the 
RV, RRV dysfunction, then this comes under intermediate low level. So intermediate low level will not get benefited with thrombolysis. But if the patient is hemodynamically stable and both RRV dysfunction on echo or PA pressure increase on echo and elevated cardiac enzymes or so pro-BNP levels are present, then this patient will get benefited from thrombolysis. So now, what our patient said. So our patient is hemodynamically stable. So straight away, high risk is gone. Now comes intermediate or low risk. On echocardiography, the PA pressures are high. We're in the range of 60, 55 or 60. And there is a RIRB dilatation. And also the pro VNP levels are very high. 3,000, more than 500, more than 3,400. So both are present. So it becomes into intermediate high risk. So now this patient should get thrombolysis, it will get benefited in terms of thrombolysis. So this is the way you should approach pulmonary embolism in terms of anticoagulation, in terms of thrombolysis. Now go and read again this uh, table and also review this pulmonary embolism severity index, which has 11 criteria present, or you should also have a little bit idea about that. So hope you uh, understand it, hope it was helpful. Thank you and see you in the next video.